Greetings from the International Space Station. I'm Expedition 51 Commander Peggy Whitson of NASA. We're delighted to join you for the inaugural Earth Optimism Summit as we celebrate and share success stories in conservation from around the world. Our unique vantage point from space allows us to see and appreciate our home planet in amazing ways. NASA observes the Earth using a variety of instruments, including some that are based right here on Space Station, for the benefit of all humanity. We wish all of you a very productive summit and thank you for the inspirational work you do in protecting our home. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, David J. Scorton. Is this a great way to start a conference with the International Space Station? What do you think? Oh yeah. Well, what a way to kick off the event with that vantage point from a geosynchronous orbit 260 miles above us. Some people may think that you have to leave this planet to get that kind of cooperation that the astronauts exhibit on the International Space Station, but all of us know better. All of us know that we can cooperate with each other and get things done. Am I right? Yes. All right. But it's a good way to get a good and very needed perspective on the shared planet a planet that sustains us, but that we need, each of us and all of us, to do a better job of sustaining. This is exactly the kind of conference that we are proud to convene at the Smithsonian Institution. In plenary sessions, we will highlight solutions to some of the biggest challenges of our times, while for the so-called deep dive sessions, you will hear some of the best speakers and success stories from around the world. Is it naive to be optimistic about the Earth? I don't think so. I think that each of us as individuals can follow the paths of scientists, artists, conservationists, and each other to make progress. We're going to work to put more conferences like this together, conferences that cross disciplines and bring the world's experts together to discuss problems and to move to solve them, in this case, problems that threaten our skies and oceans, our biodiversity, and therefore our shared future on the Earth. And our approach at the Smithsonian, as in all that we do, will also be to directly communicate news to the public. Given all the negative news reports about the state of our planet and the difficulties of governments working together to solve them, it would be easy to be cynical or pessimistic. But I believe we have plenty of reason to be optimistic. I'm not talking about being blind to the realities of the 21st century. Given all that we face, we do need a reminder that when organizations, and most important, individuals work together, we can and we will make a difference. We need to show that obstacles will be overcome with determination and with skill and with collective action. The Smithsonian is doing many things that lead me to be optimistic about our future. We're trying to keep our own place in shape by focusing more on LEED certification of our many buildings. We have energy efficient vehicles. We're doing everything we can to leave a smaller and smaller footprint. And our scientists, of course, are doing work that is breathtakingly promising and you'll hear more from them throughout the three days. And the educators at the Smithsonian, like many of you, are doing the critical, critical work of taking this information and bringing it out in understandable terms to the public. This summit launches the Smithsonian's Conservation Commons with components focused on the movement of life, working land and seascapes, and biodiversity-friendly food. The Conservation Commons is a way for the Smithsonian to combine and strengthen our conservation efforts across disciplines and across the many individual research centers at the Smithsonian. This very summit, like the Conservation Commons itself, is emblematic of what the future will hold for conservation at the Smithsonian Institution. Working across disciplines, working more collaboratively, 
and thinking about the challenges we face in a more comprehensive, collective fashion. I want to give my thanks to everyone who's been involved in putting together this event, too many to name individually. I want to thank all of our partners and sponsors, and I want to thank all of you for attending. Most important role that I have at this conference is to sit down and listen to your good ideas about ways we can make the dreams of a better future a reality. Thank you, and let's go. And now, please welcome the Mayor of Washington, D.C., the Honorable Muriel Bowser. Well, good morning, and welcome to Washington, D.C. Secretary Scorton, thank you so much for convening all of us and encouraging us to all be optimistic. I can't think of a better way uh, to start a gathering and to focus on the things that we can do together uh, for our Earth. Uh, it's my great privilege to be mayor of the nation's capital, and it happens to be my hometown. And I, it always gives me pleasure uh, to talk about the great things we're doing in Washington. Uh, I hope that you recognize, in addition to the beautiful mall and Smithsonian's, the 680,000 people in great neighborhoods we have in Washington, D.C. As the nation's capital, uh, we of course get to host wonderful national events, uh, but also get to the business of, of governing a world-class city. Uh, we recognize that we need to continue to safeguard our residents uh, from the health impacts of pollution, and we need to ensure that we are more prepared for the growing threats of climate change. And from the mayor's office, and from mayor's offices around our nation and indeed around the globe, uh, we can in fact make critical changes and have critical impacts on how our world is prepared for climate change. We are doing our part, but we are always looking for innovative solutions that will help us do our work better. Now more than ever, Americans are looking to their nation's leaders for real solutions to our country's biggest challenges. And like like you, I have the opportunity to, to meet uh, with so many different people to discuss those challenges. Part of what we're doing in Washington, D.C., uh, a key new part of our solutions, uh, is uh, I have created an office of resilience. And in that office, uh, we simply want to grow our capacity to respond and to adapt to, to change. So my resilience cabinet is made up of 13 excellent uh, government officials. We have a chief resilience officer, uh, and a key part of what uh, he does is to make sure the district's ready for any and all changes. Our our efforts to combine uh, a focus on, on sustainable solutions and fighting climate change and resilience uh, is not delinked from our economic strength as a city. And I think it's important to say that. A lot of what we do is good for the earth, but it's also good for our bottom line. And so as you look at solutions uh, in, in this wonderful setting, I hope that you will remember the tough work that mayors do every day, the big decisions we make, the things that we can do to affect policy change and procurement and implementation of the solutions that you will consider is really how we'll make change um, in this wonderful city. So I, I, I join uh, the secretary in saying enjoy, but also get to work. Have a good one. And now, please welcome senior reporter for climate and energy at ProPublica, Andrew Revkin. Ah, good morning. It's, it's wonderful to be here. It's an honor. Um, it's an honor to be working at ProPublica now. I was at the New York Times in different capacities for 21 years. And, but this is my 34th year writing about um, one story, essentially. I, you know, you got, I've written something like 4,000, 5,000 articles of various kinds worked on documentaries and other stuff, but I realize it's just one story. It's the story of our um, uh, a species coming to grips with its understanding and kind of a halting understanding that it's uh, become a global powerhouse. This is this concept, you call it the Anthropocene. Uh, as Kate, Ra uh, Kate Raworth, an uh, environmental economist in, in England, calls it the, she's worried about the Manthropocene, 
more than she is about the Anthropocene. There are people arguing about the, it's the Plasticine, or it's actually Carl Safina, good friend of mine, bi biologist, conservationist, he said it's the obscene in many ways. <laughs> but to me, what, and I've written a lot about that, but what, what's the most interesting thing is just that engagement, the fact that the word Anthropocene has created this kind of discussion and ferment. One of the wonderful things the mayor didn't mention about her work here is about the integrated nature of the way we're going to go forward. She, in 2015, I was doing some reporting <laughs> this morning, uh, she merged, uh, she put uh, energy into the uh, Department of Environment here in, in D.C. And what a smart thing that is. You, you know, so many institutions, whether it's a newspaper or a university or a city government, they're compartmentalized, there are these walls, and the more that we have an approach to um, sustainability concepts that tries to break through those walls, dissolve them, or at least have conversations across them, the better off we'll be. One of the things I've learned most about um, sustainability debates is on this planet, even though we're all homo sapiens, um, there is no we. There's the we of this room, but there's the we of the three billion people um, writing about right now who have to cook on uh, firewood or dried dung every day. Three billion out of seven is a big chunk of us still to have that pollution in their households being a part of their daily uh, challenge. So, so when you think about energy futures, you realize there's no we. So this, this next three days is going to be a discussions, uh, actionable exploration of ways to make real progress on a planet that has a lot of problems. You know, I've written about the, the vanishing vaquita, that wonderful little dolphin uh, and porpoise uh, that's going away in, in the Gulf of California be, because of international trade and illegal stuff. And, and so it's hard. You can get really bummed out. My life, my, my cycle, my optimism cycle is like this. I wake up in the morning, even this morning at 3.30 in the morning in Boston, I wake up uh, kind of optimistic, you know, getting out of bed, and I kind of go to bed kind of bummed out. <laughs> it's like what I do. But I wake up the next morning and say, okay, uh, as the mayor said, let's get busy. So uh, we're going to get busy today um, exploring all kinds of facets here this morning of uh, innovation's role in, in building a better relationship between humans and, and other species. Uh, and we're going to start. Kathleen Rogers is going to come up here. She's the president of Earth Day Network. Welcome. Good to see you. And um, so we're coming up on 50, huh? Me or Earth, Earth Day? <laughs> no, 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 you're not. I'm sure you're nowhere close to that. <laughs> so, well, very nice, but. So tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's 47th birthday? Yes, it is. is that right? So Earth Day in 1970 um, had all kinds of interesting things going on. Well, there was war still going on, there was political turmoil. Um, but, but you look back, the, the newspaper, the, the Times headline, the big banner headline that day, it was written by Joseph Lallyveld, who went on to become the executive editor of the Times, wrote the big story, and it talked about celebration and, and, and uh, flowers and stuff. It wasn't kind of all So I'm, I'm trying to get a sense from you of uh, your own perception of what's different now versus then. Many things are, feel disruptive and anomalous right now, but can you give a quick reflection on that? Yeah, I think given Earth Days now in about 195 countries, the feeling and sense of Earth Day varies, as you said earlier, very dramatically from community to community, country to country. There are many nations that participate now in Earth Day with a real sense of urgency. Yeah. We have three offices in India now, and there are tens of thousands of events, and people are marching and talking about their future. But generally speaking, I think Earth Day is itself about optimism. and so. Regardless of where we are in the current um, blip in the, on the radar, uh, yeah. I think generally speaking, people are still um, marching forward. I start out my mornings. I have to have the coffee to sort of gain the Before optimism. Before you get last. <laughs> yes. Fuel. Yeah. Um, actually, in India, I've just been learning. They have this wonderful. Um, Modi has pr pushed a program where uh, middle class, there's, there's been this longstanding subsidy for LPG, propane, the fuel that's in everybody who's got a gas grill, that white tank. It's a very clean fuel. It's better than burning wood. And uh, they have this program where they've had a subsidy for this for a long time for kind of everybody. But they've created um, an incentive for middle class people to give up their subsidy, so, uh, uh, knowing that it will go to the, the truly poor people who are still dependent on fuels. And there's this ethical component to that. It's so interesting. And I don't know whether that's going to play a role going forward in the United States in terms of how we give and take uh, between sectors of society. But if, they can, if that can happen in India, where, where the conditions are so much more 
uh, problematic than here, it gives me a source of optimism too. Uh, we're actually working on a program in India around that exact topic and mm. uh, we're promoting uh, the subsidies among the Panjayat women leaders in India who uh, once they're educated seem to take over this uh, sort of subsidy interest and are putting solar in many villages now that have zero energy. So it is exactly the right thing for Modi to be doing. Um, yeah. And it's actually turning out really well. So take me back to this next couple of days. You're doing a, well, well two things. You're, it sounds like your focus through 2020, the 50th anniversary, is very much on education generally. But then uh, here too, there's some teach-ins going on. Tomorrow. Yeah, our global theme this year um, is climate, environment, and science literacy. And our goal is to promote, and we're actually, it's working really well around the world, uh, promoting uh, mandatory environment and climate uh, literacy with a combination of facts, internalization of values, civic action, and then jobs. Uh, so that's working out really well in the developing world. Oman, Morocco, Italy, Nicaragua are all sort of jumping on the bandwagon. We're having a little more problem, in, you know, more problems in the US where we have 50 different environmental literacy plans, some of which ban the education on climate. So, um, mm. but we'll survive, we'll, we'll move forward and eventually I think we'll understand that building a movement and building a green economy and building a um, workforce uh, really depends on education. And is there some last, um, like what's the root of your optimism thinking ahead? We're, humanity, you know, between now and 2050 is kind of peak us. We're heading toward roughly 9 billion people, all of whom would prefer a middle class life to an impoverished life. And that's gonna take a lot more energy, a lot more, a lot of things. And when you, do, what's, what keeps, what's the fuel other than caffeine that takes you through? <laughs> Well, I think human beings are pretty extraordinary. And whether we're working in Botswana or Burbank, California, we see uh, communities rising to the occasion. As you all know, we're doing the March for Science tomorrow right. on the National Mall. And if you're not here at this great conference, please come down. But I think you'll see, um, we're seeing scientists and other constituencies kind of moving forward. And um, not only are they um, engaged, but they are also optimistic. They are feeling pretty good about uh, becoming uh, much more vocal about their uh, what they do and what they're doing to save the world. Yeah, and just one last quick question about the march. Um, and I've talked to many, many scientists who have different approaches to this. Um, some are marching to their local uh, library to give a talk uh, or marching to Washington. And there's a variety, there's a diversity there. One, one thing I've learned it, 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 that it's taken me a while, 34 years, <laughs> in covering environmental challenges is that diversity can all sometimes feel hard, having a diversity of responses to some issue or stress, but it seems very human. And um, you know, I think the environmental movement of the mid 20th, 20th century had, a, had more of a be, uh, be like us, we all have to be the same. Is that something that, am I misperceiving that, that diversity is a part of the path forward? It it's absolutely is. In fact, the mission, our mission of Earth Day Network is to diversify the movement. So mm -hmm. this is totally aligned with that concept. And we are seeing just about every segment of society really becoming engaged. And that includes corporations, teachers, uh, growers. I mean, everybody on Earth right. seems to want to get into it for, whether it's for a green job or it's because they care about the future collectively. But um, we are seeing the whole world sort of knitting itself slowly but surely together. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy your part of the weekend. Thanks. Thank so the, one of the cool things about a wicked problem like climate change or uh, global conservation, they're really tough problems. They're interlaced with poverty issues, politics at every scale. And um, you think, well, what is it you need? What do you have, what need to work on? The thing is everyone has a role to play. An artist, as you'll see this weekend, uh, musicians, uh, teachers, and technologists, engineers, uh, widget makers, and makers of really unusual things. You're probably some of you probably don't know who is sitting under here, but uh, you're going to find out now. And it's uh, this is where it's sort of the interface of technology and conservation. I can't think of a better uh, place to start than than here. Although I will say, again, even software people, uh, globalfishingwatch.org. Go there and see how algorithms are now uh, facilitating tracking um, fishing piracy and that kind of thing. Fantastic. But Alex uh, Dagan is going to come with, uh, with Matthew Gordon. He's going to come out now and explain what I'm talking about here and how this version of technology is helping 
us understand one of our cousins. Here you go, Alex Dagan. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> From Conservation X, I lost it here. Oh, Conservation X Labs. Conservation. And he was at the US, he was the chief scientist for the US Agency for International Development beforehand. And here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really an honor to be here with such distinguished people, but I'm actually super excited to be with my friend Matt Gordon, series producer for Spy in the Wild, who 17 years ago we used to chase lemurs uh, in Madagascar trying to understand extinction. I'm especially excited to be here with Spy Orangutan. And Spy Orangutan uh, is, is we, we, we call her Dr. Barute, who was named after one of the three amazing students that Dr. Leakey had, Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, and, and, and Dr. Brute uh, Galdikas, who studied orangutans, and they had her permission to, to, to <laughs> name it that. Yeah. But, the, but, the, but the, the extraordinary thing is she is a female Bornean orangutan, and, and if you take a look at her closely, you can, actually, you can actually see that she's got a camera in her eye uh, that 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 will allow, which is how they can, how they can, how they could actually make this series of, of films. And she has actually convinced orangutans in the wild that she's real, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Abso absolutely. Matt, can you tell us a little bit about her? Yeah. Hi. And can I say what an honor it is as well to be here? And so it's, uh, it's by orangutan. She's she's very honored. She's even been tweeting right now as well. Um, so. Hold on. Does she do selfies? Does she does, <laughs> yeah. She's very popular with the selfie crowd. <laughs> um, so Spy Orangutan was one of about 34 spy creatures that we made for a BBC and PBS series called Spy in the Wild that's just been shown out in the US uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and the idea was to be able to create these spy creatures, to get up close and personal with various animals, and to immerse the viewer into their world and get a perspective from the animal. Um, and so... By doing that, we were able to show astonishing behaviors and show how like us they really are. So it showed the intelli intelligence of the animals, how inventive they were at creating tools. And even more amazing was it was showing us complex emotions such as love. Lo love? Yeah. Why, why, why is showing emotions actually important? Okay, so um, that was actually quite amazing. What happened was we made a spy langer monkey, and um, we basically got that to be accepted by a troop of monkeys out in India. And it was so accepted that one of the uh, female monkeys came over, picked up our spy monkey, and then she dropped it on the floor. And it was at that moment when we saw this, they saw this motionless uh, spy monkey. They thought it was lifeless. And so they all started gathering around and performing this grieving behavior that the scientists we were working with were saying, this is what I've seen in the wild. You know, when they, they lose their own young, they gather around, they hug each other, they console each other, they pay their respects to the, the dead infant. And so that was at that moment we saw that we were capturing, capturing something really important. And what was amazing, this then clip went viral on the internet and it showed how it was capturing the imagination of various people from young, old, people who weren't even normally uh, interested in wildlife were saying, wow, that was really emotional. I never knew monkeys grieved, you know? And that's the key point because if they empathize with the animal, if they feel emotional about it, then that means they're gonna care for the animal. And if they care, that's what you need to help protect the planet and the animals and the wildlife and, and the planet we live in. I think monkeys and apes are really nice, but, but what about lemurs? Ah, yeah, I knew you. Spy lemur? Yeah, so I have to say I betrayed you on that after all these years. But um, basically, with that, as again, all the spy creatures we made, they, they couldn't be there just for a gimmick. So they had to be there for a reason. And unfortunately, when we were trying to capture the lemur behavior, when they get high off, uh, off millipedes, we couldn't really justify having a spy lemur doing the same kind of thing. So for that one, I'm sorry, Alex, there wasn't a spy lemur. My, my, <laughs> my favorite lemur headline ever was, was uh, lemurs show startling intelligence in the presence of food treats. So there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good reason to say lemurs. But this is actually an extraordinary piece of robotics yeah. and an extraordinary piece of technology. It's, it's one thing to create a robot that can do things, but another one to actually mimic the emotions so it's received in the wild. And it brings us to this theme of this conference, right? This idea of optimism, that we have successes that we need to amplify, as Nancy Knowlton pointed out in Nature this week. And by doing so, we can fundamentally change the narrative of conservation. 
But there's another part of optimism that we want to get at, that, that we're in the middle of a revolution of technology and science, that technology has become exponentially more powerful while simultaneously decreasing in cost. That has put a supercomputer into your pocket. That has given us artificial intelligence and machine vision. That's allowed us to use sensors from local scale to, to, to planetary scale, such as with Planet Lab's com, com, uh, completion of their constellation. It allows us to do things that were never possible to confront the underlying drivers of, of extinction head on. And uh, I want to just show a slide, um, uh, if I can. We were, we were up at Draper Labs up in Boston, Conservation X Labs, and talking to them, they just created this and announced this this year in December. And this is a sensor backpack solar power 200 milligrams that gives us the capability to have insights, if we put it on bees, to colony collapse disorder, to monitor environmental pollutants, to even confront poachers in novel ways. And it's this type of engineering, engineering that is uh, revolutionary rather than evolutionary, that gives me hope. That is a different kind of optimism that we can have. But it requires us to do something different. It requires us that conservation can't just be about conservationists, but it is about being inclusive to bring in the makers and the hackers and the economists and the storytellers behind what we're trying to do to be able to solve these problems together. And that is a great reason for optimism, which brings me to the event that we actually have going on here in the innovation commons that's in the middle of the atrium called Make for the Planet. We have 16 extraordinary teams. Can I hear from those teams? A little bit of a shout out. Like, yeah, all right. And they're multidisciplinary teams of engineers and makers and designers and, and, and artists working to their, together to create a set of solutions to conservation challenges that will be pitched to them at 11.30 by some conservation experts that we have from different organizations, different conservation organizations. We've created a pop-up maker space uh, in the Innovation Commons that, that you can visit. Uh, Dr. Barute will be there as well for, for, for <laughs> selfies and other things. Uh, we have model making equipment and electronics. And I encourage you to stop by, to interact, to even sign up to be a mentor to some of these teams if, if, you, have, if you have something to be able to offer. And then at 11.30 are those pitch sessions. And then at the end of this event, we're going to have a Shark Tank and with some pretty extraordinary judges for the top four teams. And uh, that will happen on Sunday. So it is, it is pitches for the planet. It is extraordinary to have you guys all here. And I think there are many reasons to be optimistic. So thank you. Great. Well, thanks, you. thanks for sharing. <laughs> thank you for sharing you. as well. Fantastic. So we're going to have a couple of minutes to uh, reset the uh, seats over there and some uh, Scientists are going to come out and talk about um, success in conservation. D and, and journalists, we do a really good job of telling you what's wrong, especially at ProPublica. Our whole thing is telling the world what's wrong and exposing wrongdoing. And th that's a very vital part of what has to happen in our society. But it's very rare for journalism to point out what's right. Uh, there is a, there's an effort. There's actually a group called S Solutions Journalism Network. <laughs> They're trying to do trainings for reporters and editors you know, you can actually create stories about success and get them in front of people. It, it, it's a novel concept in the newsroom. But, and, and scientists sometimes feel frustrated about that, too. Um, I met one on the shore of Lake Tahoe, uh, Sudip Chandra, who's a, a, an ecologist studying lakes around the world and rivers. And he said to me, um, he said, we're out here. He's got part of a network in uh, the West. Uh, they're looking for ecological, examples of ecological resilience. Where are lakes that are, are not warming or that are not degrading? And he says there's a lot out there. He said um, there's a lot out there, but he has to train himself to do that because he's suffused with all the negativity that it seems to permeate a, our, our media environment. So if we uh, can have our first of our three uh, examples of successes that hide in plain sight too, too often, it's uh, Gretchen Daly, who's from Stanford University. She runs the Natural Capital Project. She's going to explain to you what that means. Uh, so come on, come on up. Great. Great. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I'm really inspired by all the work that is being led by people in this room and involved in this. And, um, I'm really grateful for the chance to help open up our conversation about driving this revolution in the way people think 
about the value of nature and the way we account for nature in real world and big deal decisions. So it's incredible to see the transformation that's underway. And um, <clears throat> we can see a little bit into it looking at this um, tea plantation here in Uganda. So looking at the foreground, we can imagine the value of the tea plantation itself the value of sort of the health and the skills and the dedication of the workers involved in so carefully tending and producing that tea. We can imagine all the values associated with, say, the corporations that package up that tea and market and distribute it around the world. And, and then we ourselves, if we've enjoyed tea this morning, you know, we know, we have an idea of the values involved in that ecosystem in the foreground for a government helping to regulate what goes on there, then we too have a value um, associated with that ecosystem in the foreground. But look at the system in the background, the cloud forest. While for hundreds to thousands of years, we've developed institutions to kind of secure and maintain the productivity and the understanding of the system in the foreground, until very recently, we've had little attention to the system in the background at our sort of global, modern day economic level. But today, we see more and more of a transformation underway in looking at that cloud forest and recognizing the role that it plays in stabilizing our climate globally, in supplying water to downstream communities, whether to hydropower producers, to irrigators, <clears throat> producers in agriculture, to big cities. We recognize the biodiversity there, the many products in pharmaceuticals and many other things that come to us globally from the treasures in that cloud forest. But how do we bring that to the fore? How do we begin to think much more systematically, develop a universal language and approach for incorporating the system in the background there? really accelerating the evolution of our institutions to bring that systematically into decision making. <clears throat> we need to think much more crisply about natural capital. So, you know, we're good at thinking about physical capital, the sort of man-made stuff, financial capital, human capital, our health, knowledge, skills, social capital. We've only begun to get our arms around natural capital in a formal way that's really actionable. What is natural capital? <clears throat> well, it's simple. Earth's lands, waters, and biodiversity. We're talking about living natural capital. And we can easily appreciate our dependence on natural capital, thinking about, well, what if we went off to the moon, thinking about the astronaut there in the space station. You know, how long would we last on the moon? We're utterly dependent, as we all know, on <clears throat> the living and thin layer of life around our beautiful and unique planet Earth. Around, we're dependent on this system, the life support systems that Earth's lands, waters, and their biodiversity make up, and that supplies us with every aspect, basically, of our physical and mental well-being and many, many dimensions of our economic prosperity. We, we could not live for an instant without this. Yet we all know um, that through our aspirations, our great numbers, um, we're rapidly degrading and depleting natural capital. All around the world, we're losing forests and wetlands and coral reefs and other systems. But in a way, that's what offers us this incredible opportunity today. As we lose these, we wake up, we recognize with the increasing scarcity, <clears throat> um, the value held in natural capital. And what we can see now is a new approach developing to bring that value into decisions and harmonize people and nature. Well, how do we think about the values of natural capital? Let's just dive into that. Until pretty recently, at a global scale in our globalizing you know, economic system, we had basically a blank page on that. Um, and it's only recently now that people have started to design a really systematic way of thinking about, you know, shining a light on all the connections in our day-to-day -day lives from the minute we wake up through to that 
moment when maybe we're a little depleted at the end of the day, but of how nature delivers the, the life support that we need and all the things that make life fulfilling. Um, so looking across at these many elements of natural systems and how they interact with cities, with our food production, with how we regulate um, hydropower for energy production, clean water supply, and many other things, we can become quite systematic about the dimensions of nature that deliver these benefits. <clears throat> and this revolution, we can go back um, not long ago to the early 90s when two disciplines at war, ecology and economics, came together to start harmonizing the way we think about this. And then some of the world's greatest heroes began developing pioneering approaches to implementing that knowledge. In New York City, for example, realizing it was economically a lot more sensible to invest in watershed protection, wetlands and farmland up in the Catskills to secure drinking supply than build a filtration plant. And then Tom Lovejoy actually bringing this model to Quito, Ecuador and now seeing it spread across many parts of the world. <clears throat> we can also look at Napa in California, the famous wine growing region. That whose city actually was really depressed. Even the bakery was boarded up. That's a real sign of a depressed city. Um, and yet they then opted after years of devastating flooding to move over 100 buildings and nine bridges, reestablish this wetland shown on the left, and secure the city and revitalize the place. Another key example was Costa Rica developed the first ever nationwide payment system for these values of nature, the ecosystem services that flow from tropical forest conservation and restoration. So <clears throat> thereafter, we saw rapidly sort of a systematization of this universal approach with hundreds to even thousands of little examples coming up somewhat boutique and re relatively isolated around the world of moving knowledge into action. And now what we see, Natural Capital Project is one of many international efforts underway to drive this new, this really innovative approach into action much more widely to mainstream and scale up. And I'm going to give you an example from China. You might think that sounds crazy with all the disaster we read about in China. And indeed, it, it was kissing disaster and biblical flooding devastating air quality, water quality, and other problems that trace to deforestation in the case of flooding, loss of wetlands as well, <clears throat> and other you know, environmental devastation that has led to a dramatic investment in, in this revolution. And it's pretty simple. There are these key elements here, the understanding together with leaders of the values of nature, codifying that understanding in tools that are actionable and that decision makers who are not you know, PhD scientists, normal people sitting in corporations, in government offices, in communities, can implement in new demonstrations, all supported by an international platform that keeps advancing the innovation. So in China, after kissing disaster, um, President Xi Jinping in 2012 declared the country's dream as becoming the ecological civilization of the 21st century. And China's investing more than any other nation now in realizing that dream. And I'll just give you a really quick sketch. So um, embracing officially this approach to quantifying values of nature, using the software that we've developed together, invest for integrated valuation of ecosystem services and trade-offs. <clears throat> in um, you know, Now it's been adopted in many countries worldwide, but in China, no other place has been as focused on training people in just the first phase of training. Um, all, basically all provinces had officials in key state labs and government offices learning how to use this, integrating it with global data, and then developing their own data in China. Detailed high resolution data with um, a lot of it driven by remote sensing and a whole bunch, over 100,000 ground-truthing sites to calibrate you know, what's going on on the ground, 
vis-a-vis -vis what we can see with satellites so that they have a system of natural capital accounts where you can pinpoint exactly what's, what food is grown of the many different crop types in China, where water is held and slowly meted out to regulate hydropower production, um, irrigation, minimize the risk of dry season flows to cities. You can pinpoint you know, where carbon is being stored, where it's being lost. If you're worried about sandstorm protection in the northeastern cities, you can pinpoint which grazing communities are involved in either stabilizing or depleting you know, the ability of grasslands, shrublands to secure um, what goes into those sandstorms, secure it to the ground. And biodiversity is a huge part of this system of accounts. And then using that system of accounts, they're developing a green financial system that's in early stages at one level, but get this, <clears throat> they've used INVEST to map out the country into priority zones with these national scale priorities. Biodiversity is always in there, interestingly, as a key ingredient and engine of securing and providing resilience in the delivery of ecosystem services. And these zones now span 49% of the country. In these zones, as part of the green financial system, there's eco-compensation and many other mechanisms for compensating and rewarding, incentivizing people to restore and protect natural capital. Over 200 million people are being paid today and every day to do this in, in all of these priority areas. And um, suddenly, oh, I see, wow, the clicker stopped. Um, so, okay, I won't show further slides, but I'll just wrap up by um, saying that in, in, in a final sentence here, oh, I see, okay, well, they're demonstrating this in some key places. All of this work is demonstrated in key pilots, and uh, just going further, and in addressing the many dimensions of poverty, understanding how a payment, for example, can best be tailored to people living in remote regions whose livelihoods are intimately connected with the well-being of the entire country and indeed the world. And then um, finally, the country is <clears throat> developing a new metric, having used GDP to measure progress over the past many decades. China is saying, okay, we're, we can't just fly blind on the planet with GDP as our metric. We know how much is missing from that. So they're developing a parallel metric that will be reported alongside GDP, gross ecosystem product. And um, in all of this, I just wanted to underscore how much they're investing in science innovation and how much Ouyang and other leaders being rewarded with the highest medal that the Chinese government gives and interacting with the global community to advance worldwide now, more than 50 countries, many companies, many communities and cities using these natural capital approaches to make really pioneering institutional change that drives you know, economic investment in natural capital for the tremendous returns we get to human well-being. And just the last thing I'll say, reflecting on Confucius and thinking again in the China context. Um, <clears throat> A lot of this movement, in a way, is oriented around what Confucius said so long ago, that there are three paths to wisdom. The first is through contemplation, and that's the noblest, and a lot of us are involved at that level. The second path is through imitation, and that's the easiest, and we're all hoping, in a way, that if we demonstrate powerful new approaches, they'll be easy to imitate elsewhere. The third is through experience, and we all know that's the bitterest, and that's what, with our optimism, we aim to avoid. Thank you very much. Thank you. He said he'll take the clicker. So just hand the clicker to uh, the guy in the black. Okay, great. Thank you, Thank you Gretchen. Uh, so now, uh, for something completely different, not as different as an uh, animatronic uh, orangutan, but um, there's a company that makes beer, but there, there's a novel recipe for um, one of the products that they come up with. And here to tell you about it is Tristram Stewart, uh, founder of Feedback and Toast Ale. So come on up.
Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'll start by confessing to feeling like uh, a bit of a fraud standing up here. I did designate 2017 to uh, entrench, or rather challenge the entrenched pessimism under which I've operated for most of my life. Um, and the, the reason, just to explain why uh, I, I'm doing that, is that you know, I, I'm interested in food. Food is the single biggest impact that humans have had on nature. And it continues to be that. It's the single biggest cause of biodiversity loss. It's the single biggest source of CO2 emissions. It's by far the biggest use of fresh water. Soil erosion is mainly caused by, it goes on. And we're being told, indeed, I would call this the dominant paradigm in the food system at the moment. We're being told we need to double food production or increase it by 50%, depending on who you're listening to, to prevent starvation when there are 9 billion people on the planet by 2050. So if we're going to double already our biggest problem, and what we're told is that even if we completely replaced all energy sources with clean energy, uh, food production by itself would push us above the two degrees warming that is the, um, you know, the, the maximum we can safely uh, operate within. Yeah. These trends are not just carrying on, they're accelerating. They're being driven, I would argue, by uh, the kind of companies that I've thrown up at random pretty, pretty much. Uh, their agenda is that we need, they use this word need, we need this food. Now I contest that. If I successfully marketed to everyone in this room a can of Coca-Cola, then arguably, yeah, I need a thousand cans of Coca-Cola. But that's a very different kind of need from any kind of need that we would associate with true human needs. Indeed, I would argue that what we need to do is stop this bulldozer in its tracks because this food production system is the single biggest threat, not just to the environment, but to long-term food security because by undermining our biosphere, we really could bring about a situation where it's going to be very, very difficult to feed everyone on the planet. But at the moment, and this is the silver lining to the cloud, we actually have plenty of food. We already grow enough food to feed 12 billion people. And I'm not going to go too much into the data that I generated uh, to demonstrate this case, but suffice it to say that, have I got a pointer? No. Um, that, ooh, can I go back to that chart? Sorry. Um, this chart demonstrates that basically all rich countries have between one and a half times and two times the amount of food that their populations actually need available to them in their shops and restaurants. So a country like the US has twice as many calories as it needs. And not only is that causing environmental damage, as I've mentioned, we all know it's the root cause of many of the lifestyle diseases that our civilization is being plagued by. So you have this colossal double whammy problem being caused by overproduction at its root. So the question I pose to myself is how? How can we take on the food system? The food is it's an amazing, galvanizing topic. We all make choices around food every single day. It's very empowering that we, the citizens of the world, are the ones that create the food system. We're paying for it, we buy into it, we consume it, we make it part of our bodies. And theoretically, at least, the solutions to this problem are, by and large, delicious and nutritious, involving sustainable, accessible food for all. So, if one is gonna challenge this massive edifice, you've gotta go for its soft underbelly, the, the place where it's most vulnerable. And the one that I chose, the kind of Achilles heel of the food system, was uh, food waste. I calculated in my book that around a third of all food was being wasted in the world. And that was a conservative estimate since uh, I calculated that in my book in 2009. It's been endorsed by the likes of the United Nations and many other uh, bigger institutions. So a third of the world's food is being wasted and we're saying we need more and more food. Now, when I started on food waste, it was a pretty lonely environment to be operating in. There was really nothing. Um, but over the last several years, there has been a tidal wave of interest in this. Tomorrow, I'm going to be 
at the Tribeca Film Festival launching a film called Wasted with Anthony Bourdain. Some of the biggest chefs in the world are getting involved in food waste. You cannot be a big food company now without a bunch of food waste policies. Governments are piling in and uh, there's been mass behavior change, measurable mass behavior change. In the UK, we've measured it pretty well. 21% reduction in household food waste since 2007. It's not enough, but it shows that we can shift this needle. So my strategy in my book was to identify some of the most egregious instances of food waste, to tell the narrative about how absurd our food system was. This um, subsequent work that my organization that I founded, Feedback, uh, did um, and has been doing is looking into the supply chains of our supermarkets. This is a thousand tons of citrus fruit being wasted in Peru. I visited Peru with the National Geographic uh, about two years ago, and it was the front cover story on the National Ge Geographic magazine, if anyone saw it. Um, and these oranges are not being wasted because there's anything wrong with them, but because of these minor skin blemishes. Nothing wrong with the fruit whatsoever. And if you're having difficulty seeing those minor skin blemishes, that's kind of the point. It's a really obvious, blatantly stupid waste of resources in a country with millions of hungry people in it. My challenge is, like, if we're paying for that, what else are we paying for in this food system? I, last time I was here, I spoke about um, a, a, a success story that my organization had achieved. We um, we'd found that in Kenya, people were growing beans for European supermarkets, and that there was a colossal amount of waste in that supply chain. And I picked up on the green bean story because, well, you'll notice that these have been trimmed. But they've been trimmed in a funny way. They've been trimmed not at the end of the bean, but almost halfway through the bean. And that's because the punnet that they have to go into is exactly nine centimeters long. And the beans didn't know they had to be nine centimeters long. <laughs> they grew all sorts of different lengths. And to get them into these stupid punnets, uh, Kenyan farmers were trimming me off 20% of the bean. These are the perfect beans. All the bent beans, the not perfectly green beans, the twisty ones, the lumpy ones, they've all been left on the farm already. 30, 40% wasted at that stage. And then you get the best beans, and you're wasting 20% of the bean. So my organization identified this as a, something everyone can agree is totally ridiculous. But identifying the problem, as we've been talking about today, is not enough. You've got to propose the solution and celebrate it. And I came up with this format back in 2009, feeding 5,000 people with food that otherwise would be wasted to galvanize a movement globally against this problem. Feeding the 5,000 has become a format that we've now done in 50 cities worldwide. Indeed, this time last year, out in Ronald Reagan Plaza. We did it right here with the support of great local organizations like DC Central Kitchen, with the mayor of uh, DC, and it's a fantastic, fantastic uh, a way of doing it. Now, I want you guys to help me actually lift myself out of optimism. Um, any of you know anyone in LA? Hands up. We're doing Feeding the 5,000 in LA on May the 4th. Please tell all of your friends about it. Come and have a free lunch on us. Um, we've been organizing these events as a way of kind of proposing a visionary solution to this uh, colossal problem. We've done it across Europe, across America with the help of the Rockefeller Foundation, our, our funders here in the US. We've done it in Africa, where you know, we have loads of food waste in Kenya, and millions of hungry people. And we take this movement, we take the headlines of this movement to the corporates who are responsible for a lot of the food waste. And when I was last here, I pointed out that Tesco, this is our biggest supermarket in the UK, had changed its bean policy as a result of our campaign. And we felt we'd got halfway. Instead of topping and tailing, they were just taking the top off. Now that measure cut food waste by 30% overnight, which translated across the sector in Kenya alone, amounted to around $20 million of beans, potentially. Um, that, you know, that's such an obvious little tweak to make. But since then, we got the other half of the way. Now, they don't trim the beans at all. And guess what? They found that the shelf life of the bean massively extended because you didn't have to cut the bean, and that's where it goes off. And customers preferred it. So it's kind of that kind of example that tells the story about how absurd our system is. And it's not just tweaks like that. We've achieved regulatory change. So one of the problems these farmers get is cancellations from supermarkets, where an entire crop, such as this one, isn't going to be harvested because the supermarket canceled the order at the last minute. 
These ladies are destroying an entire crop of basil for the same reason. In the UK, we passed a law, the Groceries Code Adjudicator Act, and we now have a system being born across Europe that stops supermarkets from, order, uh, from canceling orders. Indeed, you can get a fine of up to 1% of your turnover if you do that. So it's something that is really having impact, mass behavior change, corporate change, regulatory change. I'm not satisfied, though. There are still enormous mountains of food waste, and they make me angry. And this is an example. This was in 2008, and I visited a sandwich factory making sandwiches for UK supermarkets. And all of the heels of the loaf, and indeed the first slice inside the loaf, four slices for every bread, were going into the skip. 13,000 slices of fresh bread every single day. Day fresh bread! And it's happening everywhere. Oh, God, I'd been in Pakistan that year, and there were people who couldn't afford wheat because there was a price spike, remember, 2008. And this made me really, really angry. And, you know, we tried to persuade them to, I don't know, make breadcrumbs or do anything. And as a demonstration of how delicious this kind of leftover bread can be, uh, Chef Del Hayes from the Ronald Reagan building has cooked you up some amazing leftover bread, leftover bagel recipes, which you're going to eat today, bread and butter pudding and all sorts of other like traditional uses of, uh, of waste or leftover bread. So we can all eat our way out of this problem. And that's obviously what we should be doing. Um, but I wanted a scalable solution because this is happening everywhere. And um, that was the birth, as you heard at the beginning, of uh, my latest little innovation, uh, toast ale. So we brew delicious craft ale out of waste bread. Jamie Oliver was the first person to drink this on television. It's become a really successful company in the USA, uh, in the UK rather. 100% of the profits get recycled and go into my nonprofit feedback. And today, we're launching our crowdfunder for um, Toast Ale to be launched in New York State after overcoming all of the incredible legal uh, steps that you have. I mean, prohibition would be so much easier to no negotiate. <laughs> but our proposal is that we can get wasted on waste, that, <laughs> sorry, when Cargill and Monsanto say we need their solutions, we say we need this. Any home bakers needing the bread? <laughs> we need our solution to food waste. And, uh, and we, we really need everyone to be part of this, to drink our way, to party our way. If we're going to beat those who are destroying the planet, we've got to throw a better party than them. And that is what Toast Ale is all about. It's a message in a bottle. It's a way of celebrating the delicious, nutritious solutions. And anyone who wants to join this revolution, sorry, that's the last one, <laughs> can go on to Indiegogo, put into Google Indiegogo Toast Ale, you'll find our crowdfunder, launch today, get involved, join us. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> well, I know the owner of the Dogwood Bar in Beacon, New York, and he will be very eager to put this on sale there, I can guarantee. What an exciting uh, enterprise. And, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, but the, working with consumers to, to create the pull yeah. is another challenge. You know? So you have these choices, but then you have this thirst for the uncut bean at that scale too. That's so what it's about. There we go. So uh, more to come. I, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, come on up. <laughs> We met in um, Curacao, right? Yeah, that's true. Ayana is a marine biologist originally, but I, I was fascinated there. Uh, my students at Pace University at the time, we were making a film about coral reef conservation. Mm -hmm. And um, we learned, largely through you, that the reef's future is very much tied to what we do on the land adjacent to the reef. And you've been working really hard with community building as it relates to environmental progress. So tell them about Collective. Uh, Ocean Collective, your, ah, your yes. new uh, enterprise. You go center stage there, yeah. and then we'll have a discussion over here. Hello. So I've spent much of the past decade working with Caribbean fishing communities. And the most important thing that I've learned is that ocean conservation is not about fish. Uh, ocean conservation and conservation in general is about people. It's about human behavior. It's about shifting public opinion, corporate practices, and political will towards sustainability. 
A healthy ocean is critical to food security, economies, and cultures. And right now, overfishing, pollution, coastal development, and climate change are jeopardizing all of that. In addressing these threats to ocean conservation, to ocean health, we have to ask hard questions about who benefits from ocean exploitation and conservation, and who gets screwed. Let's start by considering overfishing. Who suffers because of it? Almost half the world's population relies on seafood for its primary source of protein. New England and Newfoundland were devastated by the collapse of the cod fishery. 35,000 jobs were lost in Newfoundland alone in the 1990s. In Africa and Asia, fish scarcity spurred women traders to barter sex just for access to purchase fish, contributing to the spread of HIV. Meanwhile, large seafood companies are enslaving fishermen on Pacific tuna vessels and enslaving workers in Thailand shrimp processing plants. And overfishing by Asian nations caused some Somali fishers to turn to piracy since they could no longer make a living fishing, which in turn makes it dangerous for the remaining fishermen to go out and fish. But there is progress and cause for hope. More and more countries are creating marine reserves. However, only 1% of the ocean is fully protected from fishing, while scientists recommend at least 30%. Good fisheries management in the US has resulted in some fish populations rebounding. Enforcement is improving thanks to international treaties and satellite technology. The second major threat, pollution. Who suffers because of ocean pollution? Sewage outflows are often located near poor communities, in my experience, and rarely in front of luxury hotels. Ocean currents move, move filth without regard for who created the problem. Endless waves of plastic, trash arrive on beaches far from the source of that pollution, burdening communities with cleanup. Local economies are devastated by the effects of oil spills, and the toxins that accumulate in seafood affect human health. But again, there is progress. Infrastructure has improved in many places around the world, with secondary wastewater treatment becoming more common. In New York City, my hometown, water quality in the harbor and rivers is better now than any time in the last 100 years. In Tampa Bay, Florida, seagrass meadows had almost vanished due to toxic pollution um, and have now been restored. Third, coastal development. Who suffers from unsustainable coastal development? Coastal development often entails privatization which benefits corporations, but curtails the ways communities are able to continue to access the ocean as an economic and cultural resource. And there are deadly repercussions of destroying coastal ecosystems for development. In Southeast Asia, extensive swaths of coastal mangroves have been bulldozed in favor of shrimp aquaculture ponds. Then, in the 2004 tsunami, the locations without mangroves were the most severely impacted because residents were left without natural protection from the deadly waves. Yet there is some progress here too. Habitat restoration can be highly effective. From oyster reefs to seagrass to mangroves, local initiatives all over the world are slowly but surely replanting. A project spanning India, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, and Thailand has worked with community groups to restore 150,000 square meters of mangroves across six kilometers of coastline. Oyster restoration efforts are also gaining steam. The good news for the ocean, and in turn for us, is that these, these three threats have clear solutions that can be implemented locally without necessarily requiring arduous federal policymaking or international cooperation. However, regardless of how well we address overfishing, pollution, and coastal development, there is still the specter of climate change. Who suffers from the impacts of climate change? Lost with coral reefs will be food and income for around 500 million people. Sea level rise will force mass exodus from the Marshall Islands, the Maldives, Kiribati, and other low-lying countries, creating many millions of climate refugees. Bangladesh produces only 0.3% of global carbon emissions, yet 160 million residents are expected to lose their homes to flooding. Entire communities in coastal Louisiana and Staten Island, New York, have already had to relocate. Likely next, 
Native Alaskan villages, Miami, the Carolinas, including Princeville, the first town chartered by African Americans. There is progress on this front too, though far, far from enough. The Paris Climate Agreement was a major milestone for international policy. The C40 Cities Initiative, helping cities innovate to reduce carbon emissions and become more resilient to climate impacts. Renewable energy is supplying an increasing share of our power at an increasingly competitive price. Coastal ecosystems have an incredibly powerful natural capacity for sequestering carbon, far more per square kilometer than terrestrial forests. And the emerging blue carbon movement has uh, thus prioritized coastal restoration and protection. Yet consider this, what becomes of the fishers when the fish simply leave, moving towards the poles in search of cooler water? And who will pay the, to relocate the hundreds of millions who will be inundated by sea level rise? What of the communities devotedly protecting their local coral reefs only to see them decimated by warming and acidification? Ocean conservation, you see, is about people. And more specifically, it's about marginalized people, the communities of color and poor and working class communities whose well-being and livelihood are the most deeply affected. Either they are excluded from accessing ocean resources or are relegated to the most denuded and polluted places. And although they bear the greatest brunt of the impacts, they've often had the least hand in causing it. The examples I've listed of progress we've made to date is obviously not nearly enough, and further, uh, has not been grounded in equity. Inland, it's certainly no coincidence where garbage dumps, power plants, pipelines, and super fun sites are located. Poor communities and communities of color endure disproportionate exposure to toxic air, land, and water. New Orleans, Flint, Standing Rock, and countless places between exemplify the need to prevent such communities from bearing the brunt of environmental devastation. Hence, in the last few decades, as the environmental movement arose, right alongside it arose the environmental justice movement. According to the US Environmental Protection Agency, and I rechecked the website this morning, this is still in fact up there, <laughs> Environmental justice will exist when, quote, everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. The need for environmental justice clearly extends to the coastline and into the sea. Ocean conservation is a social justice issue. Overfishing, pollution, coastal development, and climate change tend to impact marginalized communities first and worst, but no one is immune. Solutions exist, but we need a robust intersectional coalition to implement them. It's going to be hard and complicated, and the stakes are high. The following 10 principles and approaches can serve as an initial guide for addressing ocean conservation as the social justice issue that it is. One. Diversify environmental leadership. Only 12% of environmental NGO staff and 4.6% of board members are people of color. As Whitney Tome of Green 2.0 puts it, if we are not including the people most directly impacted by environmental inequity, then the best interests of their communities will not be represented. Two, diversify the scientific research community. Who does the research determines what research gets done and what communities benefit from the results of that research. The fact that I grew up in Brooklyn with a Jamaican architect father and a white English teacher mother singing jazz and going to fancy schools has certainly informed my work with Caribbean communities on sustainable ocean use. Speaking of communities, three, consult communities. <laughs> Listen to the people on the front lines. Fishers, divers, boat captains, tour guides, naturalists uh, have not only seen ocean health deteriorate, but often, in my experience interviewing hundreds of these local experts across the Caribbean, they also have keen insights on how to turn things around. Listen to community leaders, especially the elders. Four, restructure institutions. 
we need to bring more people into the policymaking process for crafting and implementing policies. And we likely need to change some laws to do that, to ensure our system works for all and not just the privileged and wealthy. Five, apply systems thinking. Fishers I interviewed in Curacao were quick to point out that fishing restrictions alone would not make for sustainability. And of course they were right. While it is politically much easier to regulate poor fishing communities than to regulate the wealthy uh, tourism and oil industries, that is ineffective scapegoating. Solutions must reflect the interconnectedness of threats to ocean health. Six, acknowledge intersectionality. The North Atlantic Marine Association puts it this way, who fishes matters. Sustainable ocean use is a complex social issue. Race, class, gender, all play a role in who has access to and who benefits from ocean conservation. It's all intertwined. So partnerships with groups that focus on civil rights, education, health, and nutrition are not tangential, but core. Seven, conduct interdisciplinary research. Given the social complexities around conservation, we need interdisciplinary research, ecology, sociology, economics, on the distribution of costs and benefits of ocean degradation across communities and across economic sectors. Such research should be built around collaboration and transparency among local scientists, communities, and stakeholders. Nine, sorry, eight, I can't count. <laughs> Remedy past wrongs. When coastal development or pollution ruins nursery habitats and fishing collapses, and communities ache, no matter how closely fishers follow the regulations. It's time to consider how, for example, the tourism sector, worth 30 billion a year on coral reefs alone, could compensate the artisanal fishing sector for such losses. Nine, revitalize the blue economy. When we think about supporting the shift to green jobs, we should also think about blue jobs too. Local fishermen bring great value to their economies and food systems. And as I just mentioned, coastal tourism is a many billion dollar industry. The Harbor School, public high school in New York City, prepares students for maritime trades, but jobs in this sector are sparse. We need to invest in revitalizing our ports and working waterfronts and empowering and employing the people who live nearby. 10, finally. Some traditions do not scale. Communities will also have to change some of their cultural practices. When ecosystems were healthy, catching entire schools of fish was fine for subsistence on islands with a few thousand people. Throwing trash into the sea was fine when that trash was banana leaves. But with the human population over seven and a half billion and most trash now made of plastic, things have to change. We need to develop new habits and norms. Tackling these challenges justly will require changing human behavior, shifting incentives, and becoming inclusive, working at all levels from the micro local to the global and building political will. Another future is possible and we can see it emerging. When Cabo Pulmo, a coastal village in Mexico, was feeling the impacts of overfishing, the community got together and created a marine reserve, closing part of their waters to fishing. That reserve, well supported and enforced by the community, allowed fish populations to rebound, increasing 463% over the following decade. When a huge development of resorts and condos was proposed threatening that reserve, the community built an even broader coalition and successfully fought that development. The town is now thriving with an economy based on small scale ecotourism. In Barbuda, the Waite Institute's Blue Halo Initiative, which I formerly led, developed comprehensive and science-based fishing and ocean zoning regulations based on over a year of community consultations. Over many iterations, stakeholders found a balance between preserving traditions, allowing for development, and ensuring long-term sustainability. I hope to see their fish populations and economy follow in Cabo Pulmo's footsteps. But both these places relied on local expert knowledge of ecosystems, built consensus around a bold alternative vision for the future, and created a clear path to get there. Nonetheless, the specters of climate change and future unsustainable development still loom large. People often discuss ocean health as all or nothing, as a dead ocean or a healthy one, but there is a whole spectrum in between from zero to 100. We need to be honest with ourselves that 100 is out of our reach now, but wherever we land at 20, 
or 80 is within our control. And so many lives, livelihoods, and cultures hang in that balance. You'll notice that the examples I've given throughout are all local, cities, islands, communities, getting together and charting a new path. We cannot afford to wait for governments and international bodies to take the initiative. Most simply will not, unless the citizens demand it. I'm heartened by how readily citizens are standing up to demand equality and justice these days. The wave of collect collective action we are now seeing, from the Women's March to the March for Science, are cause for hope. It's time to build a social justice movement for and within ocean conservation. Here's to ocean justice. Thank you. Thank you. Take a seat. We're going to be joined by uh, another guest, uh, Anastasia Koo from Conservation International, who has an interesting background that brought her into the conservation arena. Uh, with a couple of steps, so she'll describe that very briefly. We have a few more minutes for some conversations up here. We won't have time for questions from the audience, but if you do a tweet to, uh, with hashtag Earth Optimism and at Revkin in it, I'll try to be the interface between you and the panel, and we can, uh, I'll try to get some answers to you. So there we go. Um, Anastasia, so tell, tell us a little bit about your, how, you, how you came into this arena. You, you started in environment, then went yes. somewhere else and came back. Yeah, I did. Um, well, first of all, I'm the CMO at Conservation International, right. a global organization dedicated to protecting nature. And our mission statement is, you know, our message is very simple, people need nature. And so much of what you said, you know, really resonates. Um, we don't protect nature for nature's sake. We protect it because people need it and we need it to thrive. Um, we're really proud to be part of this conference um, because optimism is one of the core values at CI. Um, and we're optimistic because um, we are a science-based organization. Um, two of our scientists are speaking tomorrow. I really encourage you to go see them. I am not a scientist. I am a communicator. Um, and I like to say that um, you know, my job is about changing hearts and minds. And as Andy mentioned, I started my career in the environmental movement, and then I moved on to the LGBT movement, um, where I led a variety of campaigns, um, most notably around marriage equality. Um, I was the person that turned the internet red uh, with the red logo in support of marriage equality. And so I have seen what it takes you know, to have achieve really amazing success as a movement. And just to give you a little bit of perspective, I joined, um, you know, I left uh, the environmental movement and joined the human rights campaign in 2005, which um, at 2004, if I can walk you back, the community suffered a devastating blow um, when 11 states had same-sex marriage bans on the ballot. And so I walked in to um, a very different landscape. Fast forward 10 years, and now marriage equality is the law of the land. And we did that through really smart and strategic campaigns um, that were both legislative and electoral. We worked with institutions like Fortune 500 companies, um, hospitals, uh, and other universities and other institutions to really protect um, people. And the work that I did was the, the public opinion. Um, and we saw sweeping change in, in, in just a mere 10 years. And so, um, you know, for me, this is a really personal movement. And the reason I came back to Conservation International is because all of those elements are there. All of the elements to run smart strategic campaigns, campaigns that are people-based, that people feel emotion, um, you know, emotion and power behind. Um, you know, in the, in the lobby, we have an amazing virtual reality um, experience that brings the Amazon to you. You know, a place that many of us will never be fortunate enough to experience, but we know um, that how important it is to protecting the planet. And so that's just one of the innovative ways that we're working to tell the story. Um, and, you know, so many others can, you yeah. know, tell a, a better based, um, you know, why science is important. But for me, I look at this and I say, you know, for the first time, you know, in many years, people are excited about science. 
They're, they're excited about the possibilities. And so all of these tenets around um, having the science, having the will, having the knowledge, I really do see so many parallels to the movement that I experienced, such rapid and great success, and what I think that we can achieve um, together. And so that's why I came back um, to the movement. I'm so honored okay. to be here with this incredible group of speakers and really looking forward to a great discussion. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about the role of education uh, in um, food, in getting in the field with students so they are understanding what natural capital is, the, the Billion Oyster Project you mentioned is a great example. The Harbor School, Google for Harbor School, and I don't know why there aren't Harbor Schools everywhere. It's, um, I think Murray Fisher's probably working on that. I, yeah, I know, but <laughs> it's, it's mostly um, low-income low students from around New York City, and the, whole, the curriculum is all built around the history and the science of, of uh, New York Harbor. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, it could, there should be a Hudson River School. At any rate, um, and in, in, in education, I've been to schools where uh, the students, uh, in some cases, said, let's try taking away the trays in the cafeteria and see what happens to food, how, how much food students choose to take or not. And it turns out a tray-free cafeteria, just because you just don't have as much capacity to carry stuff, you just don't take as much. And no one actually ends up feeling hungry at the end. So, so just if we could go around the room, is there any specific example that just juices you up completely, other than what I've already mentioned, uh, Gretchen? I'll give a quick one. I um, have been part of this effort to bring different disciplines together. And it's amazing. When you, like people joke that in academia, progress is made funeral by funeral. It's a terrible joke. Right. No, <laughs> <But it's laughs> no. Having spent six years in academia, I, um, I saw that. And so one way to kind of Newsrooms are the that same, by the way. <laughs> is to, with young students, bringing people from, you know, very different arenas together. And an example that stands out for me is um, this guy, Greg Bratman, in my lab, really interested in psychology and in how nature experience affects our, our cognitive functioning, our emotional well-being, our risk of depression, and that kind of thing. If you look in cities today, there's a huge upsurge of mental health disorders. And he, I thought he'd never get to the bottom of this. I thought it'd be a 100-year PhD. But he's um, really advanced the field, showing that just a 45-minute walk, if you're an urban person in a semi-natural kind of area, has a massive effect mm -hmm. on the way we think, on how creative and quickly our minds operate. And if you scan people's brains, which we did, you know, we'd have them come in before and after this little walk. Um, you find a m much decreased activity in the parts of the brain that are associated with kind of rumination and other kind of risk factors to depression. So without young students kind of bringing um, these different arenas together and driving a, you know, an agenda along the lines that everybody's talking about here, um, I don't think we'd, we'd get very far. So I'm... Yeah. So Tristram and, and food, is there, uh, have you seen examples where some of these Wonderful. The mission you're on trans seems to translate really well into education. I, I don't know. Yeah, and I, you know, I think I started out thinking educate the kids. Uh, I very, very swiftly realized that um, particularly younger kids, mm -hmm. they already have their instincts intact, and it's more like being getting the kids to re-educate so us. Listening. You know, you give that slideshow to a bunch of kids. Uh, well, if you do it to adults, they sort of sit there and go, mm, yeah, that's a really big problem. Kids are like, oh, why well, you can make smoothies with all those bananas, or you can make <laughs> fries with all of those, but they, they just totally yeah. get it. And they don't see the barriers that we see, the kind of entrenched institutional barriers to change. And so I have been massively inspired, and we make it an absolute rule. When we do a feeding of 5,000, we'll get kids groups to come. They'll be our ambassadors. You get a kid talking about the minor skin scars on an orange to the news uh, channels, that is so much more powerful than Tristram Stewart saying it all over again. Sure. So, you know, um, we always use kids. And then in a much more personal way, I, I, I have two young daughters now. And what I see is that we humans are so hardwired to interact with our environment through food. Uh -huh. um, I'm a keen mushroom picker. My four-year-old daughter already has 20 species under her belt. She can uh -huh. see them, identify them, name them, tell you whether they... We have these categories in our brain. The first set of questions when we were looking at nature books was, does it sting you? Can you eat it? Those are the two <laughs> things that she wants to know. Right. And it's like, that is what we are hardwired to do. Yeah. 
map the environment around us through like fight or flight, through eat or, or run. And, yeah. and we can tap into that through, through really good kind of, yeah, exposing the kids to the stuff. Yeah. It's not, not finger wagging. Hey, Ayana, when we were in Curacao, one of the things we learned was that very few people in Curacao uh, and kids uh, actually get the experience of dipping their head underwater and yeah. seeing, you know, having a mask and snorkeling. And I saw, we saw some classes there and that was really exciting to see. Yeah, so one of the first things I did, not in Curacao, but in Barbuda when I was launching a project there, was start an ocean summer camp for the kids. You have all these kids on a tropical island who have never seen a reef. They've never seen the fish alive swimming only on the dinner table. And to just see their faces completely light up when they saw something swimming around underwater, or even just um, learning what things are called and how the food web works and what eats what, um, was so inspiring. And, and of course, they go home and tell their parents. So I tell them my favorite story about coral reefs, which is that parrotfish eat um, coral and algae and poop sand. And like a lot of beach sand is actually like <laughs> it came out of the butt of a parrotfish. Right. <laughs> which is like a great tidbit of how ecosystems work. But it's also really important because you know, the, now that the groupers and snappers are gone and everyone's targeting parrotfish and their numbers are plummeting and then the algae that they would otherwise be eating is growing over everything. So it's this great opportunity to have um, the kids teach their parents. Um, and, and that's always really fun to see. And my favorite was when there was a four-year-old who I taught the word zozentheli, for those of you in the know. And he goes, Mom, these corals have zooxanthellae living inside of them. And she was like, what are you talking about? So I think, yeah, just like you were saying, this ability of children to absorb this information and like really understand the interconnectedness of things is something um, that they can teach us. Great. We're down, we're down to zero on the little clock here. But I hope we, I'm hoping we have one more minute. And if you could each go down. The other, the other realm where education seems to matter is in the corporate realm and the consumer realm. And so if you could pick one example, if you have something comes to mind, starting with Anastasia, where you saw a company that innovated in a way, sort of like with the, uh, the green beans, the whole green bean actually lasts longer. You know, someone's eyes light up, you know, where do you see opportunities? We got literally no time left, but let's go. Um, flash round. Flash round. Well, we just launched the Sustainable Coffee Challenge, um, which is really working with coffee and coffee providers to, um, you know, meet really substantial goals. And so I'm very excited about that. So many people drink coffee. I think it's a great entry point, both for consumers, corporations, um, and something that could really set the tone for how we approach sustainability. So very excited about that. Anything I am? I actually want to give a shout out to my favorite clothing brand, Reformation, which mm. uses only sort of like end fabrics that nobody else wanted anymore. So they do all these like limited runs with like extra fabric that other brands are getting rid of. Kind of like Toast Ale for clothing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Tristram. Oh, well, we, 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 we now have a UN Sustainable Development Goal to halve food waste by 2030. And there are so many companies now committing to meeting that target, to um, being transparent and reporting their food waste and showing their progress against this 2030 target. And the supermarkets, big catering companies, hotel companies, they're, they're all piling into this. And Feedback's mission will be to make that a global industry norm in the next couple of years. So that's our hope. Um, and really, when I ask myself the question, why, why, why after all these years of wasting food are they suddenly doing this? It is precisely, it's our power, it's citizen power. They're jumping into a market that has been created by incredibly creative, call them campaigners, call them marketeers, whatever. Yeah. We created demand for something. That demand is food waste reduction. And it's like, you know, this sleeping giant. Um, it's us. And if we can all wake it up, and make it take action, the corporations will, will, will jump to please right. us. The governments will jump to please us. We are the power brokers here. And, right. and I, really, I really profoundly believe it, it lies entirely with us to make that happen. Great. Gretchen, any last quick? Yeah, uh, building on this, um, I, we've been working with a lot of corporations. One is Unilever, you know, and wanting to design products and source raw materials for products that are more sustainable, but without a clear view to where you would source 
say, um, for bioplastics, the first example we tackled that go into packaging. You know, how do you get sustainable sourcing? We've developed a new, you know, analytical tool to let you look and find detail at different options and what the impacts would be on biodiversity, on water, and on carbon around the world so that the design and packaging and consumption of all the stuff that fuels our lives can be made a lot more visible and we can make better choices. Great, and then and again, it's up to all the, the thousand or so people here and anyone else who's gonna follow this online to, to be that informed consumer that's nudging companies or activists nudging companies to think about their supply chains more and even as we think about using less. We'll One last example, I'm a guitar player and a songwriter. Taylor Guitar, the, the, head, the head of that company years ago, they're running short of uh, ebony, which is that beautiful black wood that the fingerboards are made of. Uh, Madagascar's ebony is, uh, crisis has been terrible for the ecology. He went to West Africa and found a place where they, uh, they, there is still a, a sustainable supply of ebony, but it's kind of a marble that's not quite perfectly black. So he's, he's doing the thing of working with his consumers. He's trying to change the culture of guitar players so that they are no longer saying black is, pure black is what I have to have in my $2,000 guitar. And, and that, there's this interlacing there I think is really important too. Uh, doing that at scale will always be challenging. There, there are millions more guitars being made by much bigger companies. So how, scale thing uh, is the challenge going forward and, and, and sort of discipline, keeping at it. Uh, one of the things I learned in my 34 years of this issue is that it's not a, these are not problems you solve. We're talking about building a new relationship with the environment around us and with people around us. And that's a, it's a new norm. It's not like some fix it problem. And that most of our environmental problems were fix it problems. And that's one of the great things about this. It's, it's, a, it's not sort of, it's, it's a journey forward. And I, this is the beginning of a little part of that journey. So thank you for being with us today. And we're gonna take a break and start the rest of the weekend. Thank you all for being with us. <laughs>